The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon and welcome to our SIGUX webinar, Developing a Culture of Care. My name is Lori Fox and I'm the chair of the executive committee of SIGUX. And I have just a few announcements for you before I turn it over to our panelists. Everyone is muted by default on the webinar. The session is being recorded and will be available on the SIGUX YouTube channel next week to watch. If you would like to um, ask a question, you can use the questions panel and I will keep an eye on that panel and um, pop in and ask our panelists at the appropriate time. Also, if you have a microphone and would like to talk to Amy and Sue, you can raise your hand and I can unmute you. So if everyone could raise their hand right now or say hello to me in the question panel, just so I know you can hear me. Oh, there's your hands, nice job. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and put your hands down. I'm very excited to be visiting um, New Orleans this fall for the SIGX 2019 conference, November 3rd through 6th. Registration, oh, excuse me, registration is open. And you also can find on the conference website information about our panelists and the abstract of our presentations. It looks like a very strong program this year. Um, lots of great things to learn and talk about with your colleagues at SIGX 2019. Our book club um, is still going strong. We read one professional development book a month. In August, we're going to be reading The Monsters of Educational Technology, which is a book written by one of our SIGX 2019 keynote speakers. So we're pretty excited about that. In September, looking ahead, the book we're going to read is Turn the Ship Around, A True Story of Turning Followers into Leaders. Um, and we uh, typically start a new book every month. And then the last week of the month, we uh, have a book discussion in our Slack channel. Three more webinars coming up for 2019. At the end of August, we'll be talking about how to create an effective poster. Beth Lynn Nolan is gonna be giving that presentation. It's an update on the presentation she did last year. And Beth really um, loves the poster format. She is an expert in creating posters. So whether you're creating a poster for SIGX or something else, I absolutely encourage you to attend her session. In September, our webinar is Can You Teach Customer Service? And then in October, we'll hear from the SIGX 2019 committee um, with information about the conference for newcomers or really anyone planning to attend. I want to remind you that membership to SIGUX is only $25. The biggest benefit is a nice conference discount. It also makes pre-conference seminars um, very reasonably priced. Um, they are really less expensive than any conference I've ever been to. It also gives you access to the ACM digital library of SIGUX papers. So you can go back and look at any paper presented at a SIGUX conference um, and download them for reading. Also, we have a mentoring program. The mentor um, pairings are finishing up their official um, work now, and a new mentoring program will be starting after the conference. Here are some ways that you can keep in touch with SIGUX. Um, on our website, all of these links are on the page. We have an email listserv, a Facebook community, and you can follow us on Twitter. One area that's growing is our Slack community. The 
busy channels that we have um, our book club. The book club uh, has frequent conversations about the books we're currently reading. The conference channel um, is a great place to ask questions about the conference. The authors have been working together on their um, preparations for the conference. The productivity channel um, has been pretty popular and also we have a weekly challenge question every Wednesday hosted by Mo Nishiyama and Mo poses great questions about career, work-life balance, um, and is an opportunity for us to share our experiences and opinions about different questions. That's the end of my slideshow. I'm going to turn it over to our panelists, Amy Kaminsky and Sue Contarino. So Amy and Sue, I'm gonna change presenter now. And you should see your panel change. Yep. Okay, and I'm gonna go ahead and mute myself and take it away. Okay, well, good afternoon and welcome to the Culture of Care webinar. Amy and I like to start our presentation with this quote from President Roosevelt because we believe that it summarizes the culture of care in a one nice short sentence. I'm Sue Contarino and I'm the Director of Client uh, Services at Harper College. I've worked in various IT support roles for 35 years, and 25 of those years I've been in a leadership position. It's only been the last 13 years that I've worked in higher ed at, and at Harper College. I'm Amy Kaminsky, and I recently took over um, as the service desk team lead here at Harper College. I have been here for eight years, and in that time I have had many roles at the college and have led a culture of care and take five initiatives. Prior to working at Harper, I had had the honor to work at Apple, where I grew my passion for customer service. Presently, I'm finishing up my doctoral dissertation on the perceptions of community or customer service in community colleges. So before we get dive into our presentation, we want to give you some fast facts about Harper College. So Harper College is typically classified as a large community college. We serve over 35,000 students annually. Last year, Harper celebrated its 50th anniversary. When Harper College opened its doors in 1967, we were known as William Rainey Harper College, after the father of the community college movement um, and Dr. William Rainey. William Rainey was the president of the University of Chicago when his ideas helped support the development of a two-year university structure. In 1901, William Rainey founded the first public junior college in Joliet, Illinois. As the doors to Harper College were opening in 1967, a local newspaper, the Arlington Heights News, reported that community members joked that the neighbors to the west of the site would be quiet ones and give the college no trouble, since much of that area is a cemetery. Since 1967, Harper College has served over 500,000 students. We have over 300 classrooms that span 1.5 million square feet. Because of our large size, Harper employs 1,500 faculty, staff, and administration and spends over $3.5 million on technology annually. This year, we are honored to welcome our college's sixth president, Dr. Ava Proctor. So what does a culture of care look like? A culture of care at work is a place where people care about each other, leaders care about the people on their teams, and employees care about their peers. It's a supportive and employee-centered environment where we care more about just more than just about getting the work done, we care about the well-being of the individuals. It's an organization that embraces respect, responsibility, honesty, and kindness. Well, what does this look like at the Harper IT uh, department? We never miss an opportunity to celebrate. We have monthly birthday celebrations, we have baby showers, and we have holiday parties. I'm sure many of you have the same kinds of celebrations at your uh, organizations. A few of our staff members enjoy decorating the office with seasonal decorations. Right now we have a summer luau theme going on in our um, office, and I'm sure uh, in a few months we'll have 
leaves all around the office. Um, this summer, to kick off the summer season, our CIO had an ice cream social with games and raffle prizes just to celebrate. Um, we also have formal recognition of team members at the quarterly IT division meetings. And at these meetings, we recognize staff members that have gone above and beyond uh, since our last meeting. And we usually provide a token gift of a Harper IT t-shirt or a um, coffee mug. During our 50th uh, anniversary last year, there was a lot of 50th swag going on around here at Harper. But sometimes just taking note of the physical environment that we provide for employees may, and making small changes can make a big difference. In the past, it wasn't beyond Harper IT staff to do dumpster diving around campus and dig through the dumpsters when another uh, department was getting new furniture to, to garbage pick and pick out chairs uh, to take back to their offices. So just think about that for a minute. The chairs that were being thrown away by other departments were nicer than the chairs that IT was providing for their staff. I'm happy to say that that's no longer the case. We provide our staff with nice chairs to, do, to sit in while they're working. We provide bare desks if that's what's needed, and we uh, try and accommodate um, needs that employees have. Because having a team that works well together is like a well, having a well-oiled machine, and everyone on the team must be responsible to complete their duties. And the responsibility includes management providing tools and training to the staff, but it also includes staff asking for help when they need it and admitting and owning mistakes if they happen. I tell my staff all the time that if, they have, if they've made a mistake, it's not a big deal. They just need to let me know as soon as they're aware of the mistake and then I can help them um, fix that and go forward. Why would we bother to create a customer care, uh, a culture of care environment? And the bottom line is how we treat people matters. Survey after survey of why people leave jobs, um, money is never in the top five. Very seldom is it even in the top 10. It's usually the work environment and how people are treated. In a nutshell, it's as simple as happy engaged employees are better employees than unhappy disengaged employees. Engaged employees have a positive effect on the workplace, and this positive effect spreads to other employees. And the same can be said when you have a disengaged or disgruntled employee. One bad apple really does spoil the whole bunch. One disgruntled employee's negative attitude can spread through an organization like wildfire and it affect their coworkers and our students. Most of us spend about 100,000 hours of our life at work. That's a lot of time. We spend a lot of time with our coworkers. Developing relationships and treating coworkers with respect and kindness is essential to not only our well being, but the well being of the organization. At Harper, I work with a great group of people, but this hasn't always been the case. How many of you have ever worked in a place where the tension is so thick you can cut it with a knife? Amy's putting up a poll. So if you want to participate, you can text A as if, if you have worked in a place where it's not been a good environment or B if you've never, you've never worked in a place like that before. I'll give you a minute to respond. Okay, <laughs> no responses. Um, well, I've worked in those environments and I can tell you in that type of environment, people are afraid to make mistakes because of the possible repercussions. Ah, somebody else has worked there. <laughs> it, was, it took me um, a while, I gotta be honest, to uh, get signed up, so. Okay, so maybe we'll have more as I talk. Maybe you'll have more, um, yeah. Um, so the result of working in those uh, these types of organizations is people do nothing because they're afraid of making a mistake. Uh, no one talks to each other. No one shares information or helps anyone else. Personally, when I've been in this situation, it just makes my stomach in a knot because you don't look forward to going to work um, every day and seeing the people that you spend a lot of time with. Um, Prior to working at Harper College, 
I worked at several large companies, and some of these environments were literally hostile environments. In the early 2000s, I, I worked for AT&T, and at that time, AT&T and many other tech companies were experiencing layoffs and cutbacks, and managers expected more and more from their staff members and team members were literally ranked against each other. I, if I had a team of 10 people, I was asked to rank them one through 10, and then the next round of layoffs that came through, we'd get rid of the bottom one or two, depending on how many uh, people were getting cut. It's just not a, it's not a nice environment. People didn't want to share information because they knew that if they helped you, that you might be their competition. When I transitioned to higher ed 13 years ago and I took this job at Harper College, it doubled my commute time from 30 minutes to 60 minutes each way, and I took a 10% pay cut. But just to get out of that type of environment and into the type of environment that is here at Harper, and I'm sure many of your institutions have the same type where it's more like a family and people care about you more than just what you produce. So how do you create a culture of care? I'm sure many of you have heard this story or versions of this old story about um, uh, guys driving down the road and he sees two men working, they've got heavy equipment, they're digging um, a big hole, they're preparing for a foundation. And he stops and he asks the first um, guy, you know, what are you, what are you doing? And the guy says, I'm, I'm building a foundation. And then he asked the second guy, what are you doing? And he says, I'm building a hospital. So the difference between those answers is the first guy was just building a foundation because that's what he was told to do. He didn't really care about what was going to, the end result was, where the second guy knew that the work he was doing that day, building that foundation for a hospital was important work. And that one day a hospital would stand on that site, on the foundation he built, and it would treat sick people and it would be a resource for the community. So to create a culture of care, people need to care about what they're doing. And for that to happen, they need to have an understanding about why they're there and what part they play in the overall picture. And sometimes in IT, working in a back office IT support role at a college or university, it's not always clear. Many of us don't interact with students on a regular basis, and it can be easy to forget why we're there and why we do what we do. So the purpose of the institution must be defined, and it's more than just saying we're here to educate students. For example, at Harper College, our mantra has been student success. Our previous president, that was his main goal, was just student success. We had measures and we had to meet uh, and improve student success and student completion every year. And everyone at Harper College knew that student success was the primary focus. In IT, when we get new projects that come in or requests for hardware or software or um, any, anything like that, we um, ask the question, how will this improve student success? And it helps us to prioritize. It's not that we only work on student success initiatives, but it helps us to prioritize our workload. But people also need to be held accountable. Staff need to have goals and expectations that are clearly defined. And once goals and expectations are defined, leaders need to work with their team to make sure the team has the skills and tools needed to achieve expectations. Leaders should focus on positive reinforcement, focus on individual strengths and not their weaknesses, and allow for mistakes, provide frequent feedback. When I worked at IBM, um, one of the HR managers told a story to a bunch of new managers about providing feedback. And the story they, the, what they were explaining to us is, we've all been bowling. We know the goal when you're bowling is to knock down all 10 pins. Um, but imagine if you had a curtain between you and the bowling and the pins. And so you roll the first ball down the lane and you can hear that maybe some pins have dropped but you don't know if two or five drops, you don't know if they're on the left and the right or in the center. So now you go and you get your second shot, but you don't know how to make adjustments. You don't know where am I supposed to aim for the middle? Should I try and cut over to the left? I don't know where the pins are standing. It's the same thing with setting um, employee goals and providing feedback. They need to have clearly identified goals and then provide feedback so they can make adjustments. And if that doesn't happen, they get frustrated. And then when they get frustrated, they're not happy employees anymore. 
Um, transparency is very important, and you should try and be as transparent as possible when changes and decisions are being made. If people understand the thought process behind the decisions and changes being made, even if they don't agree with them, they're a little more um, apt to buy into it. So you should share as much information as you can, as soon as you can. And if you don't, people tend to fill in the blanks themselves. They don't like being left in the dark and people don't like the unknown. In one of the previous places I worked, we had someone that had been let go for what we thought the theft of one laptop. Within a day, we realized that the theft was significantly more than one laptop. And as a result of that, Inventory was being done, process and procedures were being changed, management was poking around and asking a lot of questions, and they were meeting with the police. So staff started to wonder what's going on and asking each other questions about, you know, what they had seen, what they had heard. Before the gossip got too far out of hand, I just called a quick meeting together and told the team as much information as I could, and I just stuck to the facts, which were basically... Equipment's missing and the police are investigating and I asked them please to not discuss among each other because it was an ongoing police investigation and it's not something they should speculate about. So whether it's in the workplace between a manager and a staff member or among peers between or between staff and the people we serve, even at home with family and friends, a lack of clear and timely communication will cause problems. By communicating effectively and often, you will be able to help keep rumors at bay. Recently, I had two employees in my office and they were having a dis disagreement and couldn't get to a common ground and they wanted me to mediate. So I set the tone of the conversation at first by just stating that we're gonna start with the premise that everyone has nothing but good intentions in mind and we're all working for a common goal and that no one's going to be in trouble. And the next few minutes, I listened to the both of them talk, and the conversation did not get heated, and they actually listened to each other. And I believe that's just because of the tone that was set at the beginning. And at the end, they were both able to see that neither of them had done a good job at communicating, and that's what caused the misunderstanding. Also, a few slides back, I had mentioned that providing a good physical work environment is important. Again, people spend a lot of time at work, and we should make them, make them comfortable at work. So is there anything can, that you can do if you're not a leader in your organization? And there is. There's a few things you can do. Um, when new team members come into the organization, you can help them get settled into the department, introduce them to the people they need to know, go to lunch with them. Um, many of us work on large campuses. As Amy pointed out, Harper is 1.5 million square feet. I'm sure many of you come from even larger campuses. It can be difficult to find your way around to help them uh, navigate around campus and model a healthy work-life balance and encourage them to do the same. Take, take a break at lunch. Even if you can't get away for a long period of time, just try and take a walk or do something to get away from your desk for a few minutes. And lastly, don't gossip. I don't know what it's like at where you guys work, but at Harper College, I hear more, more gossip at Harper College than all the other places I've worked combined. Gossip and speculation is a time waster and it's not productive. If you're curious about something, go to the source. Discussing with coworkers who don't know any more about the situation than you do is just a waste of time. And if you hear other people gossiping, just say to them, well, why don't you go to so-and-so and find out what's happening instead of trying to guess. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Amy and she's going to provide some real life uh, scenarios that she's ran into in the service desk in her short time there. Yeah, so over the last six or so months as I've transitioned to the service desk, these are some common issues that we seem to have come up time and time again. Hopefully they resonate with you and what you see at your colleges. So for scenario one, a user calls into the service desk because they cannot locate the any key. How would you assist the user? Laugh and tell them to hit the return key. Tell the user that the first time you saw this message while looking at your keyboard for the any key. So you understand their frustration, but explain that this message just means that you can literally hit any key to move forward. Tell the user just to hit the any key and hit the, end the call. I'm going to give you guys a few seconds to respond, and then um, if anyone has uh, 
any stories or scenarios where this happened at their location, we'd love to hear them. Yep, go ahead and raise your hand and I can unmute you if you'd like to share a story. All right, even though we don't have anyone who wants to share any stories, um, based on the scenario, um, one big thing that happened in answer B was empathy. This scenario shows empathy and provides the user with a solution without any humiliation or making the user feel stupid. By showing empathy, the service desk technician is building trust and rapport with the user. This way, when more serious issues arise or when they did something um, that they may be embarrassed to uh, commit to or say it was them, they will test up. For example, as I mentioned in our introduction, I took over as a family of our service desk just a few months ago. And a few weeks ago, on a Friday, the service desk was slammed, so I jumped on the queue to help out. After the chaos had ended, I slipped my phone into not ready status and left for the day. Well, I returned to work on Monday to find out that a faculty member was very upset as she could not get a hold of the service desk over the whole weekend. We, were, we told her that we were closed on the weekend, and she was complaining that every time she called, it would tell her that all representatives were busy. She left a message, and no one got back to her. Well, apparently, I needed to log out instead of going into not ready state, so I had left the queue line open all weekend. My manager privately brought this to my attention because she didn't want to call me out in front of the team, which was very kind of her. However, I chose to share it openly, openly with our team so that everyone on our team understood that it's okay to make mistakes and that accidents happen, and that even if you do something wrong, you know, that you're comfortable enough to come forward with your mistake or asking for help. So our second scenario. A user calls in wanting to check their email from their computer at home. The service desk employee who they spoke to told them to go to www.office.com and then click on the Outlook button. A few days later, the, user, the same user calls the service desk back and asks the same question. Where should the service desk employee tell them to go? A, www.outlook.office.com, www.webmail.herpercollege.edu, www.office.com, www.outlook.office.365.com. Because they'll all get you to the email. They will <laughs> all get you there. <laughs> All right. Yeah, we would have to agree with you that because we want a consistent answer from everyone at our service desk, we would want them to all share www.office.com. Um, consistency is something that we really strive for here in Harper IT. And I know everyone has been there when they have received different ways to solve the same problem. Although this isn't always a bad thing, provided four different websites to users to access the same product can be very confusing. Which one do I go to? Which one is the right one? Well, even though they all work, providing one consistent message is way less confusing than four very different messages. Another problem with providing multiple answers is if the person called may be with all the different suggestions and then become distrustful of the IT department as a whole, not just the one or two people they spoke to. Sometimes users will even find that one person always gives them what they consider as the easiest solution. And every call or every issue thereafter, they will latch on to that same person and expect them to be there all the time to answer their questions. From a service desk perspective, this can be difficult if the user is not available or on call when future issues arise. Making sure that information provided to end users is consistent across the service desk and the IT as a whole will help ensure end users get the same information regardless of who they speak to. And now for scenario three. A user called in stating he had just moved locations on campus. His new location had already had a computer, so he left his old computer at his old desk. Now he is requesting that his monitor, only his monitor, be swapped out for his old one. The service desk technician asked why. 
and he stated that he forgot his monitor had his icons on it. How should the service desk technician respond? Should they chuckle and tell them the monitor won't help them? Educate the user by explaining that the icons are not stored in the monitor and the icons are part of the local profile. If the user wanted these icons on the new workstation, shortcuts would be needed. Also offer to walk the user through adding these shortcuts. Tell the user that you will put in a ticket and move their monitor. <laughs> Although moving their monitor might satisfy the end user because that's where they think their icons live, once that monitor is moved over and the icons are still not there, they may be frustrated. Again, in this scenario, um, empathy may go a long way. It is clear the user thinks the icons live in the monitor, kind of like Derek Zoolander thought the files lived in the computer um, as physical files. Once the user is educated on the need to add shortcuts, they may feel stupid or like they had to ask a stupid question. Providing empathy in these situations is always helpful. Especially when working in the education field, I like to remind my peers and even my students when I teach that a lot of the employee body of an educational institution views technology as a tool, not as something they need to know. For example, a biology teacher may use a computer to put up a PowerPoint slide, but has no need to know how to work any other part of the computer. Um, just as the IT professional who comes in to fix their workstation does not need to know about the anatomy of a human. Overall, it is important to remember the user may not be an expert and that it is the technology technician's job to work with the user and provide them with a solution without making them feel stupid. Another thing in this scenario that is very prevalent is educating the user. So, the Service desk technician can, in scenario B, educate the user on how to set up shortcuts. That may take the service desk technician a couple extra minutes, maybe a little bit of added frustration, but in the end, it has the potential to make the user's experience easier over the long term of that employee's career. So by spending a few extra minutes in the front end, you may save hours of frustration as a service desk technician at the end. Scenario four. A user called, she stated she just received an email that is stating IT will be deactivating her account if she didn't click the link. What would you do? Would you A, tell her to cast the line and fish away? B, tell the user that Harbor IT would never send an unexpected link asking for confidential data. Educate the user that emails like this are malicious attempts to get personal data and show the user how to send the email to spam and send them a training video on phishing. C, tell the user that if an email says provide their blood type and personal credit card number, then it must be really from Harbor. And they should give out all their information and recommend also sending the user's social security number. Um, well, obviously, once again, the answer is B, that IT would never send an unexpected link and to educate the user about phishing. Once again, in this scenario, consistency plays a role. All IT staff should be sending the same message about the risk of phishing, regardless of who they are speaking with. Phishing is so prevalent in today's society, it is of the utmost importance that all members of the community are aware of and are providing the same message to one another. Here at Harper, we actually have a phishing campaign where we actually send out fake phishing messages to help encourage the practice of fake phishing um, and help educate our users. Um, and again, educating the user is huge because it'll help prevent things like sending out your social security number, not only at the place of employment, but also at home on their personal emails. Um, Providing users with training materials proactively and in the moment also helps promote that idea that phishing is something they should be aware of, uh, that whatever the issue is should be taken care of and continue to keep that on the mind. Um, in this scenario, it was mentioned that the service te technician was going to provide the user with further phishing training videos to help continue to grow the user's understanding of what phishing may look like. Because as we all know, the messages you get from phishing are not always the same. So having a better understanding of what a phishing email is, what it may do, 
and how you can prepare yourself or protect yourself from it is really important in all aspects of a user's daily day to day. And finally, we have our fifth scenario, which is a user called in frustrated that they locked themselves out of their account over winter break. And the service desk was not open to fix it. How dare they be taking the holiday break off as well? The user complained about all things they couldn't do during this time because their account was blocked. How should the service desk help the user? Should they A, unlock their account, B, escalate the issue to their manager since the user was frustrated and upset work wasn't done, C, change their password to Blink-182 and tell them they are good to go. Or D, emphasize with the user on how frustrating it is to be at a standstill when their account is locked. Explain that there is a way to reset the password from home and offer to work, walk the user through the steps to complete this so moving forward, the user can reset their password even if the camp is closed. So it looks like a lot of you agree with what I thought was the best answer, which was D. Um, emphasize with the user, Show them how to reset their password from home. Um, what this really does in this scenario is you're emphasizing with the user and resetting their password and helping them walk through it. So you're communicating with them about the idea that we can un unlock your account from home. You don't have to wait for the service desk to open. Um, this is something we're currently transitioning to and trying to help train our own service desk and our own employees to do on their own and unlock their password. We just recently moved to the um, using a self-service solution. So being able to walk the user through the steps needed to unlock the password at home using office.com has really been something we've been trying to communicate. Um, providing empathy is also something in the scenario that may help the end user in the long run. Everyone's been frustrated that they've locked themselves out of something at some point. So sharing your own personal experience with not being able to get work done because you've locked yourself out of your account or you can't check your banking statement because you don't remember your passwords will help you build that rapport and trust we were talking about to the end user. And again, in this scenario, the, the service desk technician spent that extra time to walk the uh, user through how to reset their own password instead of just unlocking their account or giving them a temporary password. Obviously, changing their password to something like Blink-182, although it sounds like a fabulous password, um, it's actually one of the top 10 passwords now that people use because it has a capital letter, a lowercase letter, a special character, and numbers. Um, so when they went back and looked at all the top 10 pass possible passwords, Link 182 is now one of the top passwords. So you probably don't want to do that as a temporary solution. So how do we create a culture of care for the people that we serve? So as we wrap up our presentation, we want to take a moment to reflect on a few key ways that we can create a culture of care for the people that we serve. So delivering consistency in information provided, regardless of who will be receiving that information or who is providing that information is key. This was seen in several of our scenarios, including the scenario about office.com and phishing. In both of those scenarios, we wanted to see the same message to be delivered by our service desk technicians, the same website to go to and the same message of what you should do if you think an email is a phishing email. How we communicate um, is important as well. Providing expectations of how and when we communicate um, is something that our users are always looking for. They want to know how they're going to be reached out to. Are you going to send them an email? Are you going to update a ticket? When are you going to do that? When you do a task, is it going to be at the end of the day? Open and Consistent communication is always a way to show that you're caring about the people you are serving. Um, being empathetic towards our users and building relationships and rapport through the use of empathy. So sharing those moments that you may be able to relate with the user and building those relationships really helps an end user feel like you care about them. You know, maybe even seeing them in the hall after you fix the problem and asking how you know, their day is going, or if you talked about them getting a new car, asking how their new car is working out for them, whatever the case may be, continuing to build those relationships and building that rapport will help in the long run when a customer is really frustrated 
about something that you may have no control over, but being able to know that they can trust that you're going to find the right solution for them and that you're going to put the time and effort in to figure out what's going on really goes a long way. And then finally, um, being easy to use. So in that sense that providing in-person as well as self-service training and documentation on new or commonly requested systems, softwares, and issues. So by providing the end user with training and documentation readily available so that they can either proactively learn about something new that's rolling out on campus, or for example, here at Harper, we just have rolled out the self-service password reset. So if they want to learn how to set that up on their own, we have documentation. They can request to talk to a service desk technician. They can walk them through the process. Um, and training was seen in our scenario for that press at the any key, right? The service desk technician didn't just say, hit a key, hang up the call. They explained, you know, that that really meant hitting the any key. So they're educating in the use. So we like to end our presentation with another quote of no act of kindness, no matter how, how small is ever wasted. And with that, I will open it up for any questions that anyone has. Are they on mute? Uh, they're on mute. They can raise their hands if they want, but I actually have a question for you. Um, I like that your department does some informal things together. Are those um, typically initiated by, usually by the leadership of the department or is there, um, you know, now that people are familiar with the culture that you have are, like could anyone decide to bring in ice cream or cupcakes or donuts? Yes, and it drives me nuts. <laughs> <laughs> because they usually put them right out they put them right outside my office and um yeah i don't even know when it's happening so they just take initiative and they bring they have parties all the time party That's, all the time here it is it's too bad that so many times it's food right because it, that's yeah. how we celebrate um yeah, nick our has, operator Go ahead. Oh, sorry, our operators are actually the ones who kind of decorate the office. They take it upon themselves to come in and decorate when they have a couple down moments, which is always fun to see what decorations they bring in next. Yeah, that's cool. Um, so we have a question. How do you help your staff develop empathy for each other and the larger community? How do you help others do this outside your department? Yeah, I think it's just by um, the environment that we have here. And and it, obviously it wasn't always like this. Um, when I started at Harper, we've got, we've got a new CAO since I started. Uh, we have three directors in the IT division and they're all, all three of us are new. Um, one of my peers and I, um, we've worked together for 25 years and we've just been able to develop with our team at IT. I think before it was very siloed and if somebody in one team in IT needed help from another one, there wasn't willingness. But we've just, the expectation is that we're all one team and we're all gonna help each other. And if someone, if we catch somebody not doing that, we call them out on it, right? Usually it's kind of, you do it jokingly or, but not in front of everybody. But we just try and make sure the environment set from the leadership is one of um, caring and it's okay to make mistakes. And I think it goes down, it, you know, it takes a, it takes a while, mm -hmm. um, but it will go down to all levels in the organization. I don't know, Amy is relatively new and she's not a manager, so she might have a different perspective. So I actually have a very similar perspective. I think our leadership does a great job of leading by example, so they're able to share empathy when something happens. I had a scenario where my dog got hurt at a dog park, and my director, for like a week later, was kept coming up to me and being like, oh, you know, is your dog okay? What's going on? So even beyond just the, you know, day-to-day -day grind, they're, they're trying to care about their employees and showing that empathy between one another. Um, but even at the wider 
whole Canvas umbrella, we had a culture of care initiative for the last three years as part of our strategic goal plan mm -hmm. to improve our student experience. So that really, I think, helped drive it too because it wasn't just IT who was saying, hey, let's care about each other. Let's you know, open a door for the person behind you. Or if you see a lost student, which because this campus is so large, you see often, don't just tell them go left, left, right, walk them to their destination. And you see it all over campus now. Oh, that sounds like a great place to work. It, it's not perfect, but it's pretty good. Yeah, people don't leave very often, I think, as well. <laughs> mm -hmm. Any other questions, comments, stories? Well, thank you so much for sharing your presentation. Um, this recording will be available on uh, YouTube, like I said, next week. And I hope everyone has safe travels and a great evening. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.